welcome to Shaping the Future. In this episode, I interview NASA climate scientist and author Peter Kalmus about the extreme fires in California and Hurricane Laura that struck Louisiana. Peter talks about the underlying drivers of these frightening impacts that stem from our collective addiction to burning fossil fuels. He also talks very personally about his conscious decision to speak out about how terrified he is with regard to the worsening climate breakdown. You can subscribe to Shaping the Future on any of the major channels or via YouTube. Thank you for listening. Okay, Peter, thank you very much for joining me today to talk about really what we've seen in California and in the southern states of America. I mean, it's been very visceral. Starting with the fires, could you talk a bit about the conditions that make these fires so extreme? And are they worsening? So it's quite striking what we're experiencing in California. It's, it feels a lot like what happened in Australia last winter, right? So, so this isn't just a, a regional thing. It's happening throughout the world, wherever there's basically fuel to burn in, in these subtropical areas. I would say that it's a question of drier fuel, and it's a question of heat, and it's a question of wind. Certainly when you have drought, and then you have a heat wave, what kind of set the conditions for the California fires? Then there was an unseasonal uh, lightning storm which could also be climate related. Um, I haven't read papers on that, but it was quite an unusual storm. So what's happening right now in California was uh, ignited by lightning, which is um, a little bit weird and unusual. Anyone who's ever made a campfire knows that you want dry fuel. And when it's dry and hot, you have a very high, what's called vapor pressure deficit, which means that basically all of the moisture gets sucked out of vegetation because, you know, you just have a very low relative humidity outside of the leaves. And so that moisture can't be retained. And that sets conditions for kind of very, very large fires that are very hard to control. When you look at this over a timeline, are we seeing the extremity go up is this normal so yeah i should i should uh maybe put a caveat that my my fields of earth science were uh, cloud physics and now more and more i'm switching to biodiversity um, I am working on a paper that addresses fire prediction. It's interesting. It's more something that I call data fusion, which is combining multiple satellite data records, and, and in this case, vapor pressure deficit, and seeing if a better record of these satellite observations, like lower bias, um, better coverage, better uncertainty estimates, can improve things like fire prediction. So, so I'm not specifically a fire expert, but Um, I I do have a lot of friends who are fire experts. You know, you can just look at the acres burned in California. The fires burning now are two of the three worst fires that California has ever had are burning right now. The fire season just in like a couple of weeks in August in California saw more acres burned than all of, I think, 2018 or 2019 can't remember exactly, but it's already been one, if not the worst fire season in California history. And we're not even in September yet. And the fire season now goes until December. So we're so very early. So this could be, if this continues, 2020 will absolutely be a record shattering fire year in California and in much of the West. And so, yeah, this is largely driven by global heating, which is causing drought and it's causing heat waves, which lead to fire conditions. And in some cases, in some vegetation regimes, it can even increase the fuel load by um, having wetter springs. So if you have a very wet spring, that grows a lot of grasses and shrubs, for example. All of that by a very dry, hot summer, it can lead to a worse fire season. You mentioned the link to climate change, global warming. Emissions are still going up. Is there a countervailing force? I can't see there is. What do you think? Um, well, I mean, there's a <laughs> there's a climate movement. <laughs> so there's a social force which is countervailing, yeah. which is which is growing, <laughs> which is growing by leaps and bounds. Um, I wish it had grown decades ago, but it was hard, very, very hard to grow a climate movement without, frankly, without the visceral fear that comes from experiencing these kinds of climate enhanced disasters, the hurricanes, the wildfires, the floods, the sea level rise, the crop yield losses. So now more and more people are experiencing this and they can see the future in the present. This is an emergency because a few years ago, some climate leaders and climate scientists were, the phrase, this is a new normal, was in vogue. 
And I pushed back against that really hard because this is absolutely not a new normal. What we have is an escalator going up and up towards worse climate emergency, yeah, worse, worse climate impacts, um, enhanced disasters affecting more and more people with a, a larger death toll and larger uh, economic toll. So if you look at any of the global metrics of global heating, uh, things like global mean surface temperature or things like ocean heat or things like Greenland ice loss or Antarctic ice loss or sea level rise, or ecological breakdown, or the motions of marine and terrestrial life toward the poles, storms getting worse, precipitation getting worse. Almost any metric that you look at in the Earth system right now that interacts with the atmosphere or with the ocean or with uh, the carbon cycle, there's a huge, unmistakable, whopping signal of global heating, which is coming from obviously human, human emissions of greenhouse gases. So it's not a subtle signal anymore in any part of the Earth system. 10 or 20 years ago, it was still, in lots of ways, the signal you still had to like pull it out of the noise and you still had to look at model projections. And, and now we're in the climate present. We're at one, a little over one degree Celsius of global heating now, and the signal isn't subtle. So what that means is that normal people that aren't scientists, that aren't studying this, that aren't well-versed in the model projections, um, and that aren't well-versed in satellite data sets, they can see this in many cases in their own backyards. Uh, in, yeah. it, they, they say like, wow, you know, this is a really crazy warm winter. Winters didn't, weren't like this when I was a kid. Or th this heat wave is crazy in the summertime, or I've never seen a storm like this. Or they look at the wildfires, if they're not living in the wildfire regions, they look at them, and they say, this is crazy. You know, they're breathing in that smoke and they're like, it was never like this and I can't escape it. And so they become climate activists. Yeah, and yeah. so then you have conditions for a climate movement um, that we didn't have before. I wish all 8 billion humans were scientists and they were kind of influenced in their actions by projections and by physics. There's a, there's a lag here, of course, where the impacts we're experiencing now were effectively from greenhouse gases that were emitted decades ago. Part of the tragedy of climate breakdown is that human society isn't able to scientifically anticipate disaster that's very clear to scientists that's coming decades in the future. And we're still at some level at that stage right now. So all of those metrics that I mentioned, they're going up like escalators. So, you know, whenever somebody ex expresses uh, maybe a little bit of surprise that it's yet another record-breaking hot year, globally speaking, that shouldn't come as a surprise at all, because that's what a trend is. This year is hotter than this year, which is hotter than this year, which is hotter than this year. There's a little bit of noise as, as ener heat energy sloshes around between parts of the climate system. So you might have more ocean heat one year, which means you have less you know, increase in atmospheric heat that year. And, and, and vice versa. So you get these spikes, this kind of like decadal time scale. So it's not a new normal. It's going to get worse and worse uh, the more um, greenhouse gases we emit. And so we still need the, to, to kind of listen to the scientific projections and kind of say like, what kind of a planet do we want to live in five years from now or 10 years from now. A few years ago, people were writing books about their grandkids, right? And it's, it's now it's very much a problem about the here and now. People are yeah. dying now. Yeah. Livelihoods are being wrecked now. Parts of the planet around the equator are becoming uninhabitable due to humid heat. The human body can't, if it gets, if the wet bulb temperature gets too high, your body can't get rid of the excess heat through sweat anymore. So that system in your body breaks down and you get heat exhaustion and you can die. So we're gonna have to start you know, abandoning swaths of the planet around the equator. We're gonna have to be, start abandoning cities near the coasts. I mean, it sounds like I'm a real doomsayer or uh, you know, a few years ago, people would have said like, that's science fiction. You're, a few years ago, I felt this very strongly as a scientist who was speaking out a lot. I felt like I was really going out onto a thin branch that you know, my managers were gonna saw off and that the public was going to saw off and they were going to be like, you're too much of an alarmist. I mean, the climate deniers certainly tried to do that, but it was something I felt very strongly, just um, like, this is frightening to speak out in this way. And, and I think it's 100% warranted by this, the projections and by what we're experiencing today. So it sounds really scary. I'm amazed that anyone 
is still buying property in Miami. It's not something that I would choose to do. <laughs> sure, okay. sure. Does that, does that answer your question? I, I'm not yeah, saying it does. It does. And... Force, but there's a social force. Um, unfortunately, uh, the physics is not on our side right now. You know, aerosols aren't on our side right now because as we move away from fossil fuels, it means less kind of aerosol reflection of solar radiation, which means there's a little bit more heating, global heating hiding in this sort of, it's, it's not exactly a protective layer because it kills us when we breathe it in. It goes into our lungs and our cardiovascular, but it's preventing the planet from being even hotter than it is right now. So that's not on our sides. Any, Policymakers and the fossil fuel industry certainly aren't on our side right now. So With the removal um, of the aerosol layer. So, I mean, I've heard some really dire stuff people talking about, and I, I haven't really known whether to, to give it any seriousness. But that absence of this aerosol layer causing a little spike, is that something that we should worry about? I mean, I'm not saying we should spray more aerosols, but I'm... I mean, I think we should be worried about carbon emissions mostly. Um, yeah. We should also be worried about um, methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions, um, and we should be worried about uh, aerosols. But the main thing is, is carbon dioxide. Um, that's the thing that's going to stay in the atmosphere for thousands of years. That's the thing that's mostly driving global heating right now. As we clean up our act and transition away from fossil fuels, unless there's deliberate geoengineering that happens, which uh, I am not a fan of, but unless that happens, yeah, there will be a few tenths of a degree spike. Um, okay. And there's still pretty big error bars on, on what that spike would be. But there's no question that there's a little bit of additional heat hiding in that reflective aerosol layer right now. And those aerosols come out of the atmosphere pretty quickly after we stop emitting them. So yeah, I think we, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. And mm. that's not a good reason to keep burning fossil fuels, right? Because that's certainly heading us right over the cliff. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and you talked about this, this social dimension, and I agree with you that on this sort of visceral level, when you see those pictures of the fires or the hurricane from space, it's, it's quite awe-inspiring that those hurricane shots, but you, we don't tend to see the destruction that's going on you know, afterwards when these people have to return to their homes, for example, or their businesses, or it's just destroyed. And one of the things that really brought, you know, your tweets have become quite charged. <laughs> I'm just yeah. going to read one, to, one that actually inspired me to, to reach out to you was, media, please make the connection between all these disasters and climate change ridiculously clear. So society develops the will to actually fucking do something. Thanks. Yeah. And, it, and I think you're making a, a really good point here. We're kind of normalizing these images in our mind without really understanding everything you've just said, basically. Yeah, I'm not even drunk when I write those tweets. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes <laughs> that was my next is, question. <laughs> sometimes it is late at night and, um, and it's just like I'm feeling overwhelmed. And yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to communicate about this. And um, I feel like I'm sometimes a little bit of a, uh, a black sheep because, you know, I, I, I don't hide the fact that I'm terrified about this. I really am, um, genuinely. Like sometimes I feel panic attacks come on or I wake up in the middle of the night and I feel like, like earth is slipping away on my watch. And, um, but you're but not alone. You're not alone in that. I mean, yeah, that's, in I the, think, that's in the activist space as well. You're seeing a yeah, hell of a lot of that. Exactly. And when, when I say slipping away, that's a, it's a very personal thing. I mean, I, I have, I get so much criticism for speaking like this. Um, it's, it's hard. It's, I, I don't know how to do it better. So I speak, I speak from what I'm personally feeling. And I'm a father too. I've got two young kids and it breaks my heart, the world that we're leaving them. And, um, I study, uh, coral reefs and, um, the reason I study them is because I, I was reading news stories about how they're dying and it just, it literally broke my heart. It made me cry. Um, I feel for them. I don't, I don't know why more people don't feel for them. Um, I empathize with them. I, I, feel, I feel them dying, like literally cooking on the reefs because of ocean heat waves. Um, so sometimes they bleach and they, 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 they can't, they're, they're, the, the algae, the photosynthetic algae that creates most of their food starts um, creating free radicals and they, it can't, they can't exist in their flesh anymore. So they, they eject that algae and they start to starve. Sometimes they literally start to cook, it's so hot. So they, they just die, they don't starve, they just die from the heat. The same way that 
you know, towards the end of the century, people might start dying if they're outside for too long, um, too close to the equator on a typical day. Um, so it, it hits me very emotionally um, and I can't not speak out about it. Like if it's a threat to my career, so be it. Um, you know, the, my, I love doing science. Um, I started out in astrophysics. I switched in 2012 to earth, earth science and I, I love the feeling of contributing to humanity's knowledge and to exploring in that way, to exploring physics and to exploring this planet. Um, I, I decide, it's, a, it's just fascinating how everything works. And so I, I love that, but I'm willing to, I'm willing to risk it all because um, I just, I can't, I can't watch this happening. And the implications for millions of years of uh, the sixth mass extinction and for generations and generations of humans who can't go to parts of the planet because it's too hot. I don't know. I, I how can I not say that f bomb? You know, it's. But I, I think you you mentioned it in your your book. This idea was well, not an idea. It's an experience of of grieving in a way that you go through. Yeah. Now I think again you did say in the book that any, anyone who works in this sphere you can't really escape it. Generally, the human response is that you get down and you, you go through a period of really suffering, I think. And when you come out the other side, it's a different, you don't really feel any different, but you're sort of, you can actually re-engage again. And, and, but what it sounds like is that this is actually even more complex than grieving because you've got the next generation in front of you. It's almost like a revolving nightmare in a way because it, we go back to the social thing. Everything's happening on too small of a scale at too slow a pace. You know, we're a couple of decades behind where we should be on all this. And what you said in the book was, it was almost like you would come to a new place. But what you're saying there about the coral reefs is there's almost, it comes back, is like a, a very hard place to be. Um, it comes it comes and it goes. It is very complicated and it's it's constantly changing for me. and. I think that, you know, my emotional, anyone's emotional experience of this, this epoch, this uh, climate and ecological breakdown is very, very personal. And I don't think there's going to be two people that experience it in the same way. I think we've been interchanging these words like climate grief and climate anxiety for a long time, climate despair. They're very distinct things. And there's dozens of other emotions that are in this complicated mix. You know, some people feel guilty. Some people feel regret. Some people feel shame. Some people feel panic. Some people feel deeply sad. And there's dozens of other emotions. I mean, I think it's, it's important for us to start expressing how we feel at a more detailed level. Because I believe, and, and I've experienced this in myself, there's still, frankly, and I, I say this with compassion because I love my colleagues dearly and I'm grateful every, they're, they're brilliant. And there's so many scientists doing incredible work. You know, I, I'm kind of starting out in the field. I, I'm, I'm still early career. So I haven't really made a huge contribution to science. And, and I'm acutely aware of that fact. But at the same time, I think a lot of my colleagues, and maybe even especially some of the senior ones um, who, have, who have made some of the great contributions, are, are in, in so, and frankly, in levels of denial. Like, it's very painful to be out of denial. You know, Greta Thunberg is an example of what a human being looks like who is, if not completely out of denial, uh, very, very close to that. And really looking at this crisis fully in the face, looking at the science, looking at the projections, being fully emotionally aware of what's being lost right now. And she puts her entire being into doing whatever she can to help solve this problem. She's terrified, you know, she's working overtime to raise awareness. Burning fossil fuel feels disgusting to her, so that's why she, you know, took a boat to the U.S. Um, instead of flying. It's like, it's so part of her because she's facing it, but um, I'm sure it's very painful for her, just like it's very painful for me. And it's, it's easier to sort of pretend at some level that this is under control and that technologies are coming that will suck the carbon out of the atmosphere, net zero emissions. That's such an insidious phrase, right? Because it suggests that somehow we have this under control to go publicly and talk about the science, but in a very clinical way with, with jargon and words and plots. That's, a, that's important to do. To me, that's, that's only a fairly small fraction of the information that needs to be communicated right now. There's this 
the facts are like the tip of the iceberg and they're not, facts are what motivate non-scientists to act. The big part of the iceberg is emotional information, which is largely not being conveyed by the scientific community because they're like, that's, that's not our job. They don't really know how to do it. There's been Star Trek, what, you know, spent episodes and episodes exploring this interesting thing of this, this separation of scientists from emotions and how hard it is for, there was Spock and then there was data, right? This whole, this whole kind of dialogue of can scientists actually be in touch with their emotions too? And I think subconsciously, those shows, interestingly, touched on something very deep that I think there's something very profound about being simultaneously in touch with these facts and in touch with these projections, which have incredible implications for life on this planet. I, and then to, to allow that to go down into a deeper subconscious level into the emotions and then to be able to express that. So it's such a hard thing to talk about because I know this isn't the job of scientists to, to communicate uh, emotional information. But it's, and I'm not a social scientist, I'm well aware of that. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not a psychologist, I'm well aware of that too. But just from my own experience of communicating this for 15 years, my experience is that, so first of all, if you're a scientist, you have to decide if you're willing to sound the alarm. Is this worth sounding the alarm over and potentially risking your career? Um, this is not astrophysics. This is not, you know, searching for gravitational waves or looking at um, galaxies outside of our galaxy. Um, this is science, climate science, earth science. This is science with profound implications for us right now, for our kids, for frontline communities, for non-human ecosystems, stretching, again, like I said, literally for millions of years. Decisions that are made in the next few years will have essentially, at some level, cosmic implications, because this is the only planet we know of that has life, and it has implications for life on this planet literally for millions of years. And it's gonna constrain human accomplishment and human, so what is our species capable of? We don't even know. I mean, like, what, what could we do 10,000 years from now or a million years from now? What kind of a species do we want to be? And is it, is it really worth holding back all of those future humans and, and other potentially intelligent life on this planet just so we can burn a little bit of fossil fuel in the next few years? If you're a scientist and you think that, that you need to sound the alarm, maybe because of your kids or maybe because of the coral reefs or maybe whatever it is for you personally, that is extremely important to you. And to me, it's very clear the answer is yes, I need to sound the alarm. As a human, as a father, as a citizen, if not as a scientist, I can't not do that. <laughs> yeah. I simply can't. So if you do decide that it's, it's time to sound the alarm, how do you do that effectively? And I've spoken to so many audiences and the way you connect with them is by, first, you can show the science, absolutely. That's very important to do. Yeah. And then you, you take off the lab coat and you tell the audience, you say, now I'm speaking as a human. I'm speaking as a parent. This is terrifying stuff. Let's look at this plot again that I just showed you and think about what that means for life on this planet. <laughs> and, and it should terrify you for these reasons. <laughs> you know, here's what it, here, that plot, that innocuous looking plot, you know, with two axes and a line going up, here's what that means in terms of loss for this planet, Ir irreversible loss, right? Here's how that makes me feel, you know? I hope more scientists start doing this. Some people will say that's exactly the wrong thing to do, but well, I think we need also a variety of, of channels to communicate. Absolutely. And I, I was just going to go back to your, your tweet again and this fact that really the media are not telling the story. They're not um, telling it in the right way because really that should be an extension of your communication tool is being able to tell the story through the media so that we actually make better decisions. We actually start going. Exactly. Yeah, Nick. So it, it comes back to um, the movement. So it's very clear to me that we need radical policies as soon as possible to actually meaningfully reduce global emissions. A tiny number of people voluntarily deciding to fly less will certainly not solve this problem. It would be ridiculous to think that. Uh, it's not a bad thing to do, and it actually helps build the movement, in my opinion. But we certainly need policies. To get those policies, we need a huge grassroots movement because unfortunately we've just lived through the last few decades. It's very clear. There's clear, clear evidence, documents for anyone to look at of a very, very powerful industry, uh, arguably the most powerful industry that this planet has ever uh, had on it, the fossil fuel industry, 
um, knowing very well what their products are doing to this planet and to our collective future and making the completely deliberate conscious decision to, first of all, shoot down any policy that could possibly transition us away from using fossil fuels. So they do that by, uh, by basically buying politicians. So they, can, they don't donate to political campaigns, then they get to write the laws and the politicians are, are too afraid to actually stand up to them. And not only that, but they've, they've very purposely and con consciously and incredibly unethically, there's, I can't think, if I try to think of something you know, more evil than this, because it is leading to genocide. They've, they've purposely misled the public to try to convince the public that the science is wrong and that, first of all, that maybe that this isn't really happening or that it's not dangerous or that we're helpless to stop it. It's completely unconscionable, but they've done it. We have clear evidence and they're still doing it now and they're greenwashing and they, they own the politicians. So in other words, Almost all of the power on this planet, the financial power, you know, investment institutions, the fossil fuel industry, celebrities who, you know, don't want to like face the fact that they can't really maybe keep flying in their private jets. The celebrities are incredibly powerful in, in how they set norms. The policymakers themselves, the two-party system in the United States, which uh, the fossil fuel industry donates to both of them. And they both, you know, we haven't seen effective policy from either party. You know, and there's a, and a dynamic of deadlock, bipartisan deadlock is preventing meaningful change. The power that's arrayed against us, that's, that's causing the planet to hurtle towards catastrophe. Um, and is, is not even, we're, we haven't even been able to end subsidies, huge subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, which sure. is a no brainer, right? The Democratic National Committee just a few days ago said that uh, it was a mistake that ending fossil fuel subsidies was in their platform and they took it out. That's it's unbelievable, isn't it? Un unconscionable. So the most obvious, easiest, simplest, no brainer thing to do end fossil fuel subsidies. We haven't, as a climate movement, we haven't even been able to accomplish that. And so the power rate against us is massive. So that's why, the, in my opinion, the only way to get the radical policy change, the Green New Deal that we need, eventually to move away from growth addicted capitalism and towards a growth agnostic uh, economic system, which is even harder than moving the energy system away from a carbon based energy system. The only way we can possibly do that is with a massively powerful grassroots climate movement. Um, so I can't remember your original question. <laughs> everything I do, oh, it took talking to the public, right? We need, so we need to get the public to realize that this is an emergency. That's the bottom line. Whatever any one of us can do to convince our neighbors and colleagues and friends and the public at large through writing, through art, through running for office, through supporting campaigns, through getting arrested on the street, whatever it is that we're able to contribute if it helps raise awareness, public awareness, that this, is a, that this is a global emergency of the first order, a top priority for humanity at every level, the municipal level, at the state level, at the national level, at the international level, even in how we think about living our own lives. Anything that can raise that awareness of emergency, that's, in my opinion, that's what we need right now. Because the powers that be, the establishment which is centered around a fossil fuel economy, you know, and all the goodies that that brings to the billionaire class, they're just not going to relinquish that voluntarily. They'll greenwash. They'll try to convince us that they'll talk about 2050. 2050, let's think about that. That's 30 years from now. So all those people in power, they know they're not going to be in power anymore. So it's such a big, pardon my language, it's such a big fuck you to the yeah. youth to even mention 2050 it's as no the problem. time. When we, yeah, when you think about it, it's, a, it's, inc it's an incredibly brazen, just middle finger to, to anyone, you know, basically under the age of 40, especially to the, to the kids, to the youth, to the teenagers. It's, and to, it's yeah. unbelievable. If we go back to these visceral impacts, which in the last five years, it seems to have escalated in terms of the fires the meltouts the hurricanes you know it's becoming like a horror show every year and really in 2030 it's going to be worse so, you know i'm guessing as a as a lay person i'm not 100 oh, percent certainty it's going to be worse no matter and, what we do now we have to accept that and do everything we can but yes 100 percent. but to, to then start talking about policy in 2050 or reducing emissions i mean you have to be insane i think to think that that is acceptable to go back to your earlier point that's why the mainstream medium uh, media has let us down 
in such a massive way, right? So under that tweet that you read, uh, I, like last night, I added a second tweet to it, which one of the kind of media watch organizations had looked at 50 television stories and uh, about Hurricane Laura and not a single one of them. So zero for 50 mentioned climate, not to mention you know, Green New Deals or solutions or that this is an emergency, but even to mention the word climate uh, in, in conjunction with- and That is the link between us and these yeah, events. But it's not surprising that we're still stuck in this, this tragic 2050 dialogue, this meaningless dialogue. This, this, it's a way for current policymakers to say, we're not gonna do anything. If they say we're, we needed to ramp down by 2050, and they have a four-year term, that's their way of saying, I'm not going to think about it. That's yeah. really what it is. And part of the reason that, that, you know, that's, that, that can happen, that it's possible that people aren't in a furor over that, is because of this really weird media blackout, which if you're cynical, you would say maybe there's financial incentives working there that are causing that. I don't know. I'm not a media expert. But it sure looks weird that you can have these very, very clear uh, climate enhanced, climate worsened disasters. And, you know, a reporter wants to, to give the truth and wants to kind of give all of the relevant information. It's very, very obvious from a scientific point of view that talking about the, uh, the, the role of global heating in these disasters uh, is very clear now. So how can you in good conscience as a journalist report on this without even mentioning that? It's, I'm not sure. I, but with the election that you've got going on now in the States, which is just so polarized, it's unbelievable. Do you think that the climate rhetoric on the Democrat side is meaningful? I mean, you've just mentioned that they've taken out um, the subsidy. Yeah, no, I don't think it's terribly meaningful. I think the thing that will be meaningful is when they say we can't take any money from the fossil fuel industry anymore. Zero. But Once that, they actually do that and, and they stop, completely stop taking that money, then it will be meaningful because then I'll know that they have, that they feel like they can actually take action. It's easy to make promises as a politician. Sure. It's much harder to actually take action. So it's, there are ways to, to let your corporate fossil fuel industry donors know that you're not going to hurt them while still making these kinds of promises to the public. And, and that's the problem. So I'm glad we're having this dialogue. I'm really, really glad mainstream politicians are talking about this and actually putting, putting together plans that are remarkably good compared to what we, we had you know, in the past. So that's a step in the right direction. And what it means is that the, the reason they're doing that is because the climate movement got this strong over the last two years. And it has to get stronger again. It has to take it to the next level to completely sever that tie with the fossil fuel industry. So basically what has to happen is the social license for the fossil fuel industry has to be taken away by this grassroots movement. And once that happens, it'll be too dangerous for policymakers to accept that money anymore. And once that happens, we'll be in the position where we can expect actual change, but not before that. I should clarify that uh, Joe Biden, he did not agree with the Democratic Party platform to say we will not end fossil fuel subsidies. He still says he wants to end fossil fuel subsidies, but his party, the official party platform, was not even courageous enough or not even independent enough from the fossil fuel industry to say we're going to end fossil fuel subsidies. That's quite remarkable. That's the tragedy, really, is that we know that this will happen at some point, but we're playing with such a tight window of time, of what we, you know, we're beyond time, and it's just edging still off in the distance. Yeah, the tragedy for me as a single human is to know this and to see very clearly what's happening, you know, and to feel like... Um, we're, we're losing so much of what I value on this planet and that so many groups of people will be destroyed um, by what's happening now and which is getting worse and worse. To know that very, very clearly and to, first of all, to see no action at the policy level. And then as, as a human too, to, to be in this weird position of like, I just want to stand on my rooftop and scream about this, but I know I have to walk this really weird tightrope of knowing that if I do that too much and too stridently, I'll be ignored. And this is already happening. A lot of the kind of more moderate scientists, uh, I think, have decided that I'm being too extreme in sounding the alarm. Or maybe there's power dynamics where they want the institutions and the, you know, the, 
the kind of climate centers um, want to kind of keep power and they don't want power to go to scientists who are too alarmist, right? They, there's this, I don't know how to put it in words. There's almost this sense of these institutions, they want to act like things are more under control than they really are so that they can be policy advisors to the president and so that they can keep them, the funding flowing because they don't want to scare their donor base too much who might not be at this level of emergency. There's this sense of kind of power and money and influence wanting to be preserved, certainly by institutions and even by some individual kind of prominent scientists. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's like by writing tweets with swear words and kind of criticizing party politics because I want them to do better. I want the parties to do better for on climate. You know, I don't want Biden to lose and Trump to win. Yeah, I want sure. the Democrats to do better. And I think that doing better on climate is a winning issue in electoral politics. I think it's starting to shift enough that now you can win elections by talking about, in some precincts, by talking about the Green New Deal. And yeah. that shift is going to continue. I want politicians who are going to do something about climate to win. And I want parties that are going to do something about climate to win. And so I'm, my criticism isn't meant to, to cause them to lose. It's to try to help them to win more. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a wrecking ball it is literally speaking out. It's saying we need to be more ambitious than we've ever been on this issue. But I think it also, the, the visceral nature of the tweets, for example, it has its own level of authenticity because a lot of people are genuinely anxious. It doesn't mean every scientist has to do this, but it, it, actually this guy is saying what I feel. So, so I, I am a real honest to God scientist. I, I do work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a NASA center. I'm beyond honored to work there. I am speaking on my own behalf here. I try to make that very, very clear, very mm -hmm. often. I'm not the world's best climate scientist, but I work really, really hard. I'm still early career. I started Earth Science in 2012 and I did my PhD in physics. I studied astrophysics. And so I had to learn on the job real fast. And I'm, I'm doing my best, but at the same time, you know, I, I kind of made two decisions very consciously about how I speak about this. Um, one is that I will just speak what I feel is true, both scientifically and emotionally. And I'm not going to hold back because uh, it's too important. And I love, frankly, I love my kids too much. And I love life on this planet too much to hold back. And the second thing I decided was that climate activists have been being too polite. And there's almost like a, this, you know, civil discourse and being polite and being too polite intersects with power and personal power and these kinds of power dynamics and the status quo in, in ways that are beyond me as a scientist and I, th I think are probably really interesting to sociologists. I, I hope they are at least. But, but I decided that uh, climate activists have been being too polite and that we're at the point now where people are literally dying and we're locking in death and suffering for thousands of years and for millions of years, uh, if you look at biodiversity recovery after mass extinctions. And this is all happening right now in the, the coming days, the coming years certainly, but I would say even at this point, every day is important. And that if, if I feel like my, my kind of, where I'm at right now in terms of, of this stuff, this terrifying stuff that I'm seeing warrants tweeting impolitely or speaking really um, harshly about institutions, that I, I have to do it, that I have a responsibility to myself, to my principles and to my children uh, to do that. And I, I'm not good at messaging. I'm not a publicist. I can't try to predict what's going to move an audience the most. And, and I, my instinct is that um, the public isn't afraid enough, but it doesn't matter to me really what, like how best to motivate the public because my, my truth right now is that this is scary stuff. There's like, you know, bystander effect, right? Like the public's looking to, I'll say this, as nicely as I can, you know, basically, but sci climate scientists are, are experts on what's happening right now to the climate system, which is killing people. <laughs> the stuff that's happening right now is killing people. And whether they like it or not, we climate scientists are the experts on that. And the public looks to us for cues about how concerned they should be. So we're the ones, in some sense, I would say that climate scientists didn't sign up for this, but we're kind of in this position. We're the bystanders. There's someone bleeding out who needs medical attention immediately. And there's people acting like it's not a big deal. And so all the, the other people look around at those people and say, oh, they're not that worried. It must not really be that serious. It looks bad, 
to me, but they're not doing anything, so it's not that bad. And I, unfortunately, I think the scientists have more power than they think or than they want, because when we act like things aren't that bad, it's just so hard because we want to maintain that aura of objectivity. Um, and I try really hard as a scientist to be as objective as I can. And I honestly don't think, if you, if you look at my papers and the science that I've done, I don't think there's any way that, you know, it can even have the appearance of being influenced by how alarmed I am about what's happening. But yeah, I think, you know, to get the public to move, <laughs> the scientists, scientists are the, the ones that the public's looking to and we have to actually act like this is a fucking emergency so that the public gets it and starts to push the policy forward. So that's what I feel is true. And I, I hope sociologists back me up. If they tell me to shut up, maybe I'll, I'll rethink things. But that's what I feel is true. That's what I've experienced over 15 years of increasingly speaking out and talking to the public. So I'm not into messaging. I'm just like... Science itself is a, is a discovery of truth in a way. And if you're speaking based on your principles from you know, what you see and what you feel, it's still in the line of a kind of honesty that's in line with the job, even though the job has to be objective. Do you see what I mean? I think there's a sort of validity and everyone responds differently, like you said earlier. I, I think that's right. I think actually not being in denial about this stuff and being willing to face it directly is actually a very scientific thing to do, even though it's going to bring out a lot of emotions that aren't pleasant. But you know, as a scientist, you don't want to look away from stuff. You want to really kind of look at the truth and all of its forms. And it's a very hard place to be navigating these emotional truths and these scientific truths simultaneously. But well, I think we covered quite a bit there. And it, thank you very much for, for taking the time. Um, it's your morning. It's my evening. <laughs> it's Friday night. Um, and yeah. I think I'm going to have a glass of wine and, and get depressed and start tweeting. But the, <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks for having me on, Nick. And thanks That's for your cool. work of uh, raising awareness about this. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.